Good morning. My name is Dave Simmons. I'm a member of the Board of Directors for the Association of Beltel Retirees. And I would like to welcome you to a somewhat unusual annual meeting. Right now, I would like to ask you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I would like now to introduce fellow board member Una Kelly. Thank you. A hearty and warm welcome to the Association of Beltel Retirees 24th Annual Meeting and to our very first virtual annual meeting. We are grateful to the Butler Associates, our trusted and respected public relations firm since 1997. The Butler team is facilitating this first ever virtual annual meeting, which is also very necessary in this also very abnormal year. I am Una Kelly, your treasurer at the association. It's my honor and my privilege to speak with you today. Know that the board of directors shares the desires, hopes and dreams and the fears and concerns of all who hear and watch this broadcast. This is true whether you are a long-term member or you're just now learning about the association. All are welcome to join in our shared core endeavor protecting existing and promoting enhanced retirement security for all workers, retirees, and your families. Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights expresses in part, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of self and family. That includes medical care, necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, and yes, old age. Today, let's acknowledge that we must fight together in pursuit of all rights. If you fight for your own rights, you also likely consider the rights of all. I would like to quote a socially conscious lawyer by the name of William Reese Smith. He wasn't the only one to have this notion, but I think he said it very well and very succinct. Quote, we must remember that a right lost to one is a right lost to all, unquote. As responsible citizens and self-advocates, please do register to vote, do vote, and do submit your 2020 census. Ensuring a complete and accurate 2020 census is probably one of the most important civil rights issues of the day. Simply put, civil rights guarantees equal social opportunities and equal protection under the law. Currently, some 300 federally funded programs rely on the 2010 census data to distribute some 675 billion, that's right, with a B, billion dollars to states and localities. That includes funding for schools, roads, hospitals, and programs that aid older Americans, like Medicare, Medicare Part B. The next census is in the year 2030. So do understand that the stakes are high. If you miss the 2020 census, you and your family will not be represented in the census during the next decade. It's quick, it's easy, it's secure, and it's confidential. The website is my2020census.gov. That's my2020census.gov. Please know that the association is dedicated to protecting your retirement security and your earned benefits. Stand with us, be counted, let's fight together. Without further delay, we will now proceed with eager anticipation to hear the riveting messages from our esteemed speakers. Thank you, yours in solidarity.
John Colomega. I'm the uh, recording secretary for the Association of Belltel Retirees, uh, a role I've had for about a year and a half now. I uh, just want to update the membership that uh, each year we open up the board seats on the board of directors to uh, new members, anyone who wants to join, or current members of the board who are interested in another role. Uh, this year, everything was delayed again with the virus and uh, not able to meet and so on like that. But uh, what happened in April is we opened up the election for anyone interested in a particular seat. And uh, what happened was that all the current members in the seats that I'll mention in a minute decided to stay on in those same roles for another year. Uh, what that means to you is that Jack Cohen will continue as chairman of the uh, ABTR. Lionel Brandon will continue as the executive vice president. Una Kelly as the treasurer, Dave Kaufman as the chief financial officer, and myself as the recording secretary with uh, Tom Steed also as the assistant treasurer. So uh, uh, thank you very much. And again, just wanted to give you this update. Good morning. My name is Bob Gaglione. I've been a member of the uh, ABTR Board of Directors for about nine years now. I retired from Verizon in 2011 after spending a little bit more than 30 years in various corporate finance organizations with the company. Today I'd like to spend a few moments uh, speaking about uh, a distribution option for members that have reached a certain age. So let's get started. So today we're going to spend a few minutes speaking about qualified charitable distributions or QCDs. We'll talk about what a QCD is, the advantages of a QCD, and the QCD requirements that must be met in order for them to qualify. So what is a QCD? A qualified charitable distribution allows individuals who are 70 and a half years old or older to donate to one or more charities directly from their taxable IRA instead of taking a required minimum, required minimum distribution. So I, for those of you that are, are, are approaching 70 or, or thereabouts and have money in an IRA, you know that uh, RMDs or required minimum distributions are something that we've all been alerted to and are preparing to take. Well, a qualified charitable distribution helps uh, helps us satisfy the requirement, the IRB requirement, but uh, we'll see in a moment, one of the advantages is that, or a chief advantage of an RMD, or QCD, is that your adjusted gross income doesn't increase. So let's take a look at the benefits of a QCD. Okay, so what are the advantages of a QCD? As I mentioned, any amount given to charity using a QCD will count towards your annual RMD, but will not be included in your taxable income. So it will not become part of your adjusted gross income or AGI. So other potential benefits of that will include uh, the reduced AGI may result in lower taxable social security benefits or future Medicare premiums. It can help increase your other potential itemized deductions such as medical expenses. And depending on your state residency, using a QCD to lower your AGI may provide a reduction in your state income tax liability. Let's take a look at the requirements of QCD. So QCD requirements include the fact that you need to be, or the requirement that you need to be 70 and a half years old at the time you request such a distribution. The funds must come out of your IRA by the RMD deadline, which is typically the end of the year tax year. Funds must be transferred directly from your IRA custodian to the qualified charity. This is accomplished by speaking with your investment company, say for instance Fidelity, or your money manager and asking that this, this be taken care of 
uh, by the, the, the organization that's managing your accounts. The maximum annual contribution amount or QCD amount is $100,000. And the account types that are eligible for QCDs include traditional IRAs, inherited IRAs, and SEPs and simple IRAs. So in conclusion, a QCD can be a valuable tool in managing your overall investment portfolio and the distribution of assets when you've reached 70 and a half. If you have any questions concerning these, uh, I'd suggest that you contact a financial planner or your tax professional and be sure that you follow all the requirements as I identified on the earlier slide. That's about it. Thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Don Kaufman. I retired from Bell Atlantic Verizon, so I may not have met many of you from within the footprint of our other companies that our retirees have come from. Today, I'll report on the association's 2019 financial results. First, let's deal with contributions. In 2019, from you, our dedicated and generous members, the contributions totaled $545,432, a substantial amount. This is down slightly from our 2018 levels, but an excellent showing. Now, total operating expenses in 2019, due to some aggressive cost reduction efforts, reduced our expenses 26% from the previous year 2018 and they totaled four hundred ninety seven thousand four hundred forty seven dollars i'll cover these reduction efforts in the following discussion so let's first look at the four major categories of association expenses in 2019 professional fees represent roughly 25 percent of the total these fees encompass the legal fees necessary to maintain our work on pension protection, i.e. de-risking, and on health care, and our efforts in filing our proxies. They also encompass our accounting expenses for monthly bookkeeping, as well as the required external audit and the required state filing fees. As an association, we must file annual reports in roughly 36 states. The next category, media services, constitute approximately 22% of these expenses. These are key elements in our efforts to provide a spotlight on our plans and successes in social media, as well as external print and digital media. We know that these campaigns often remind and help direct Verizon on issues important to retirees and employees. Our third category is printing and postage. And they represent roughly 18% of the total expenses. Simply stated, the quarterly newsletters, which fall into this category, are the major source and medium to communicate with you, our members. It is in this category that we achieved substantial cost savings this past year by renegotiating web vendor contracts and revamping the newsletter format. Remember the different page size that came out. These changes saved printing and postage expenditures without compromising quality. 
And the last of the four categories is employee salaries, which represented roughly 16.5% of total expenditures. We also restructured the staff, resulting in one full-time senior manager and one part-time employee to handle all the diverse day-to-day -day business of the association. These are the folks available to you to assist you on an individual basis. And again, savings without compromising quality. So overall, I think a very successful year. Since we're well along on the year here in 2020, peaking ahead to the 2020 financials, contributions are running slightly below expectations, but look good given the recession in my mind and the pandemic that we're all faced with. Expense reduction efforts have continued in 2020, in part, but not entirely, related to COVID-19. Expenses are expected to be well below 2019 levels, resulting from restrictions on travel and gatherings. We have held Zoom board meetings and member meetings, which are good to keep everyone informed, although they restrict personal interaction. Like many of you, my wife and I have been unable to travel out of state to visit grandkids and so forth. We have regular Zoom meetings with them, but they are not the same as being there in person for birthdays, et cetera. So the association is hoping to be able to return in 2021 to regular member meetings and mini meetings and our normal annual meeting. Your very generous contributions are the key to our success, and we appreciate it. As you may know, you may make direct tax-deductible cash contributions to the Association of Beltel Retirees. You can also make qualified charitable donations from your IRA, which would also be considered tax-deductible. You can further support our advocacy by participating in the Amazon SMILE program and also make the association a recipient of a legacy donation. In fact, you can use more than one of these options. So there's multiple options you have. We run and continue to operate on volunteer power and your generous tax deductible contributions make our work possible. I ask you to please be generous with your financial support in consideration of our important work to protect our fellow retirees. Thank you. to talk to you about a program we have here at the association called uh, smile.amazon or amazon smile what it amounts to is a donation that uh, amazon will make to a legitimate 501c3 charitable organization about a year and a half two years ago i brought this up with the board um and uh when I told them about it, I, I got a few snickers um, because the donation is one half of 1%. And if you think about it, what does that add up to? Really, a half a percent? If I spend $100, what is that, 50 cents? Now, it doesn't amount to much. But through the uh, cooperation and, and the, uh, let's say, the diligence of association members, their friends, their families, their acquaintances. You have done a wonderful job and we want to continue it. To date, the Smile Amazon program has donated to the Association of Beltel Retirees $3,366.52 as of August of this year. 
I uh, implore you, please, if you aren't a member of Amazon Smile, um, it's very easy. If, if you already are a member, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. In order to get on to Amazon Smile, you just go up. If you are an Amazon shopper, you go into, um, instead of doing Amazon.com, do smile.amazon.com. The first time you log in with that URL in your in your computer browser, you will be prompted to choose a charity. You can search on the many charities. There's thousands of them. If you search on Belltel Retirees, you can search on Association of Belltel Retirees. You can put in the entire name, the Association of Belltel Retirees Incorporated. It will bring up probably a few to choose from. Make sure you choose Belltel Retirees from Cold Spring Harbor, New York, and you will be set up from that point on. Everything you buy using the smile.amazon.com website, if it's an eligible purchase, you will be donating one half of 1% to the, to the association. Important thing to remember here is it doesn't cost the association anything to get these recommend these uh, donations. It doesn't cost you as an individual anything. There is nothing added onto the price of what you purchase. This is money donated by Amazon to us at no cost to you, the individual, or us, the association. So please, Amazon.smile. It's uh, smile.amazon.com. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Edward Stone and I'm special counsel for the Association of Belltel Retirees. I've been involved with the association for close to 10 years now. Uh, my original involvement started when all of a sudden folks learned that 41,000 Verizon retirees were being kicked out of the Verizon pension plan and they landed in the laps of an insurance company as certificate holders under a group annuity contract. And that's somewhat of a new phenomenon known as pension de-risking or pension risk transfer. I'm gonna to talk to you today about what that all means and what the association has been doing about it over the past several years. So um, if we go to the first slide, we talk about what pension de-risking is. Pension de-risking is any decision by a defined benefit plan sponsor to get rid of pension liabilities. Those types of decisions can take a number of forms. It can be a change in investment strategy. It can be the purchase of an annuity contract inside of a pension plan. It can be offering lump sum benefits to certain retirees. But what's most relevant for the association members is what I call a pension lift out, where a defined benefit plan sponsor purchases an annuity contract, but kicks you out of the defined benefit plan and you default to state law. So the next slide talks specifically about that, and that is pension de-risking involving an annuity contract purchase. So as I had mentioned at the outset, in 2012, Verizon essentially kicked 41,000 retirees out of their pension plan and they transferred all of the payment obligations to Prudential Financial. Uh, a Verizon subsidiary purchased an annuity contract, which is a group annuity contract. Um, and this was kind of a, a unique transaction. It was one of the first times ever where a defined benefit plan sponsor amended its pension plan to get rid of retirees. Termination of a pension plan has been 
a common practice over the past century or so. Uh, companies go out of business, they terminate their pension plan, uh, and they transfer all the obligations to an annuity contract, but everybody gets treated the same. In the case of the Verizon retirees, there were approximately 100,000 retirees who were covered by the plan, 41,000 got kicked out, and some number greater than 50,000 remained. So it's a very unusual transaction in that some people who were, who were um, beneficiaries under the plan were still in, and some were kicked out. That led to a lot of litigation, but unfortunately, the Supreme Court has ruled that if you can't show current economic harm, you don't have standing to bring a lawsuit under Article 3 of the United States Constitution. And this uh, holding, which came up in this case, which the association took all the way to the Supreme Court through the great work of Curtis Kennedy, um, has reverberated and the Supreme Court has even doubled down. In a recent case involving the U.S. Bank matter, Thole versus U.S. Bank, the Supreme Court said, even when you see what looks like a breach of a fiduciary duty, if no retirees get hurt and if they can still get, make, get the payments in the future, you can't challenge the transaction. And that was subject to a lot of scrutiny, but right now the, the environment at the Supreme Court is very difficult for ERISA claims. In any event, insurance companies has been taking on more and more risk since the Verizon transaction. And as of June, 2017, Prudential had taken on 400 billion just related to PRT. And as of May of this year, Prudential accounts for approximately one third of all pension risk transfer business. Just for your own edification, pension risk transfer and pension de-risking are really the same thing. They're kind of inter interchangeable terms. From the insurance companies, they like to talk about it as pension risk transfer. I always refer to it as pension de-risking when I speak about it from the retiree's perspective. So the next slide speaks about why this really matters. What do retirees lose and why is it important? Well, first and foremost, retirees lose the uniform protections that were intended by Congress under ERISA. ERISA was signed into law in 1974, and it was designed to protect employees and retirees from abuses in the workplace. Um, and it was designed to give uniform protections so that all retirees would be treated equally. Under ERISA protected pension plans, creditors can't get at annuity payments, can't get at pension payments. All participants have ready access to the federal courts. All uh, fiduciaries, all uh, control parties are held to fiduciary standards. As some of you may recall, when this was a defined benefit plan, you would get an annual statement with detailed financial disclosures. With a group annuity contract, there are no disclosures whatsoever. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, retirees lose the benefit of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation coverage, which provides a monthly benefit that increases as a function of age. Unfortunately, now retirees default to state law and state guarantee association coverages, which are not uniform and for the most part, unfunded. So the, the next slide does a little bit of a comparison between a defined benefit plan pension that's federally protected and a group annuity contract that's governed by state law. I think the most important issues are really uniform protection from creditors under ERISA, detailed annual statements. It's good to know where you are so you don't find out too late in the game that there's, there's a problem. Uh, very important as well is the fact that the defined benefit plan sponsor is a fiduciary and under ERISA is supposed to act in the best interest of plan participants. That's very important because the insurance company has no such fiduciary duty. And then the PBGC provides a lifetime of monthly payments in the event that the uh, employer goes under. And a lifetime of payments is very important because nobody really knows how long a retiree is gonna live. And not to be crass about it, but 
you know, state guarantee association coverage is per individual per lifetime. And so folks who live longer might not get anywhere near enough coverage. And folks who live a short time might get the same amount of coverage as they got under the PBGC program, but there's absolutely no way of knowing. And frankly, the way I look at it, payout annuities just don't lend themselves to this per individual, per lifetime coverage amount. Um, most states provide $250,000 in coverage. I use Massachusetts as an example. That's kind of the minimum that's in force right now. When we started this whole endeavor, by the way, it was 100,000, but many states adopted the NAIC guidelines and upped it to 250. There are a number of other states who have 300,000 in coverage, and there are four states that have, offer $500,000 in coverage. What's really important to understand about guarantee association coverage is that it's voluntary, and it's what I refer to as a post insolvency assessment vehicle, which means that there's no real money in the guarantee funds. They get contributions and they make assessments of their members and all of their members are insurance companies who write business in a particular state. And the amount that they can assess per year is capped. So there's only so much that a large insurer can actually tap to, to get coverage up to the, the amounts that are needed. So the bottom line is the best thing possible is under all circumstances, trying to avoid an insurance company insolvency, particularly an insurance company the size of a Prudential or a MetLife. And the reason that these different regimes exist is because under the McCarran-Ferguson Act, all of the, the business of insurance is relegated to the states, unless there's a statute that specifically says this is the business of insurance and this is regulated at the federal level. And that only happens in rare instances. Okay, so moving, moving on to the next slide, which is kind of interesting from my perspective is, is just, you know, really why do retirees need to care about this? Well, first and foremost, there are very few annuity providers in the pension risk transfer business. There's really only a handful. And there's hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars at stake. Unfortunately, we all learned during the financial crisis that nobody is too big to fail. And just because a company appears to be large and look good on paper, there are a lot of things that can happen um, that could change that situation relatively quickly. And we've also learned, unfortunately, that more and more of the publicly traded life insurance companies have been engaging in very suspect financial transactions involving affiliates or captive reinsurers where they're really just moving risk around within the fam same family and not, not engaging in true risk transfer. And the, and the reason that's a, that's a concern is because most of the pension payments that you folks are looking to, to receive are due over a long period of time. And by swapping reserves, which are hard assets, admitted assets, assets that a regulated company would be able to hold, for reinsurance contracts with affiliates, um, a lot of companies have been able to transfer uh, risk to companies that don't have the commensurate assets to meet those liabilities in the event of a stress scenario. So to the extent that there was a stress scenario on a large publicly traded life insurance company, those IOUs that are due from affiliates might not be money good. To add to that, you know, we've learned just through what's happened in the public markets about some servicing disasters involving group annuity contracts. Um, one in particular involved MetLife, and it was really a disaster that led to them paying significant penalties to the regulators. But essentially, if you think through the, the whole process and you're, and you're somewhat skeptical or cynical, you know, if they can't find somebody, that's found money. Because, you know, they, they got a chunk of change in exchange for a promise to make payments. If they don't have to make those payments, they don't give the money back to Verizon. Essentially, they keep it. So it creates kind of a perverse incentive to lose people. And I'm not saying that's what's happening with Prudential. Not at all, but it just creates the wrong incentive. And when 
you're looking at thousands and thousands of people and billions and billions of dollars, you could see where, um, you know, that creates the wrong incentive. Okay, so the next slide goes into a little bit more detail about what actually happened with MetLife. So they, they bought a lot of different um, pension obligations. So it wasn't all stuff that was originated internally, but they forgot or neglected or failed to pay tens of thousands of retirees. Most of these were small payment amounts, but the payments were simply not made. And it was, it was a long period of time that this went unnoticed. But the regulators found out about it through a series of disclosures and investigations, and they slapped MetLife with a very hefty fine. So did the SEC, um, and they apologized for doing it. And they said they were going to enact very significant new procedures to avoid this happening. But they also, also contributed more than $500 million to their reserves, which says something more was going on here. And basically the more was because they didn't have those liabilities on the books, they were able to take the money out of the reserves and use it for other corporate purposes. Once they realized that they had been caught with their hand in the proverbial cookie jar, they had to make amends and they had to not only pay a fine, but they had to put a lot more back into reserves to avoid further fines. In any event, right after they did this, business was business as usual. In 2018, FedEx did a huge deal involving six billion in pension plan obligations. Ironically, the number of retirees with FedEx was almost exactly the same as the number for Verizon, at least as published. It was listed at 41,000. Verizon was also listed at 41,000. And again, Lockheed Martin just transferred 1.9 billion uh, to MetLife. So MetLife, even with the lost pension debacle, the fines, the contributing money to reserves, it still seemed to be a good place for folks to go uh, to get off risk. Okay, the next slide kind of quantifies just how much business has gone on since I originally got involved in dealing with the association. So that number is not a lie. That's almost $160 billion, which, you know, it's real money. And that's just in obligations transferred from 2012 to June of 2020. Now, I will put out, point out that uh, volume is going down, I guess, with the <clears throat> pandemic and some changes to pension plan accounting as a result of the CARES Act, there hasn't been as much volume. Uh, the volume is significantly off, down by 50% lower than any quarter over the past two years, um, down to $2.3 billion in the in the third quarter. So I think, um, I'm sorry, second quarter. So I think that that's a part, in part related to the pandemic, and it's also in part related to the fact that under the CARES Act, the fine benefit plan sponsors do not have to contribute their minimum required contribution in 2020. So they have until 2021 to start making those minimum required contributions again. So it's kind of a, uh, a funding holiday for defined benefit plan sponsors, which makes it less pressing for them to try and get off risk. Okay, so turning to the next slide, which is really what my efforts have really focused on over the past eight years or so, and that is the need for state legislation. You know, as we talked about post McCarran Ferguson, the business of insurance is relegated to the states. As you can see by this colorful map, there's a lot of different states. And as you guys know from watching the news, we have a lot of different viewpoints on how things should be done and what's important. And so each state makes its own laws and has its own procedures for dealing with things like uh, pension risk transfer. And so we've started a campaign in a number of different states to introduce legislation to, to replace the protections that were lost once a company uh, de-risks. So the next slide will give you a little bit of background on what the Association of Belltel Retirees has been doing. Um, the association has supported state legislation that provides protection of annuity benefits from creditor claims. Again, just replacing a protection that folks had under ERISA and lost. We're advocating strongly to limit subsequent transfers, what we're trying to do is prevent 
a solvent insurance company from transferring these payment liabilities to a less solvent insurance company. And we've been successful in at least one state and we've gotten traction in a number of others, but this is a very difficult thing to do because it imposes requirements on folks. And frankly, it's something that people have never really looked at and, and don't always fully understand. We've also asked for mandatory annual disclosures. We believe it's important for retirees to be fully informed about what's happening with their pensions. Um, very often, insurance company uh, lobbyists oppose disclosures of any type, although they acknowledge that some could be reasonable, they haven't really signed on to this notion. And we would like to make all insurance companies fiduciaries with respect to retirees. We don't think that that's a unfair leap since under ERISA, the plan sponsor was a fiduciary. We believe that the insurance company that takes on the commitment to make these payments to retirees through no choice of the retirees, the retirees were never given a choice when their pension was de-risked. We think that the insurance company should be held to a fiduciary standard. Finally, I discussed a little bit about why I don't think guarantee association coverage makes sense per individual, per lifetime, capped coverage. That means if you have a life insurance company, a life insurance contract and an annuity contract with the same carrier, you're capped. And if you have two annuities, uh, you're capped at, <clears throat> at that per individual, per lifetime amount. And that we don't think is, is fair. So we've tried to introduce legislation to push for real reinsurance to cover the difference between guarantee association coverage and PBGC coverage. Now, this is kind of calling folks bluffs because if there really was no issue with insurance companies making payments under these group annuity contracts, it shouldn't cost a lot of money for them to buy reinsurance to provide peace of mind for retirees. Um, so that's where we'll see where, where the rubber meets the road, whether or not we can get that passed. But that's one of the things that we are trying to do at the state level. So that kind of summarizes uh, the efforts of the association when it comes to pension de-risking. Um, I'm proud to be a part of the first ever virtual annual meeting and I can be reached very easily either directly or you can contact the association and they'll reach out to me and I thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you and I wish you all a safe and healthy remainder of 2020. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jack Cohen and I have the honor of being the chairman of the board for the Association of Beltel Retirees and I am so glad you are here today with us. Um, as, as you know, uh, especially if you're longtime uh, members, we generally have an annual meeting in a different geographical area each year we've had them in Atlantic City, Annapolis, Maryland, Syracuse, New York, Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, Milford, Massachusetts, so many places. And uh, we did have plans, as you probably know, to have one in Long I on Long Island, but uh, most important to us, uh, as it should be to everybody, uh, that's the, the health and well-being of our membership. And uh, now we are involved in this technology and, and we're getting used to it. And as I'm sure you are, uh, you've heard from many members of our board uh, in this video. And uh, you were originally welcomed by Una and Una and Don Kaufman take care of the donations that you, your generous contributions. Uh, and get to us and, and they make sure that 
those donations are put to good use and, and, and they watch, uh, they are bean counters. And Una, frankly, is a, she's a gem. She makes, she makes a buffalo scream on a nickel. Okay, bank managers who charge us fees uh, for various and sundry uh, 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 operations that they perform for us, they run like hell when they see her coming. Uh, anyway, I'm glad you got to meet her and also John Colomega, who's our, uh, he's our secretary and he's been doing a fantastic, fantastic job. Uh, our CFO, uh, the other half of the uh, the Treasury Group, and I also should should add that Tommy Steed is part of the Finance Committee, but uh, Don Kaufman is our CFO, and he talked about uh, our financials and efforts to keep expenses controlled in this, especially in this pandemic environment. Uh, the the maximum. Uh, Making a maximum effort to control our expenses has been a challenge, but uh, we've been able we've been able to do it. And uh, uh, and then you also heard from Bob Gaglione, and he's he's a, a subject matter expert in finance, and uh, he discussed the new nuances of the new acronyms that have we've been exposed to lately, called RMD, the required minimum distributions from our 401ks and also things like QCDs, which are qualified charitable distributions. And the subject is dry, admittedly, and uh, uh, it, it can be used at times as a cure for insomnia, but uh, it's important that we're all aware of these things. And, uh, and I'm glad he had an opportunity to make that presentation. David Simmons, and I came into the association the same year, and that was in 2008. And we call him, quote, our wedding planner, uh, which is another way of saying that he has jurisdiction over our membership, annual membership meetings. And it's a, it's a year round effort to organize this. And he helped phase us in to the technology age. Uh, he's very astute in that capacity. You also heard from Eddie Stone. Eddie is not a member of our board, but he plays a vital role in our battles uh, to uh, in, on the subject of pension transfer, uh, de-risking, and so forth. Uh, he uh, he makes sure that ERISA protections don't fall in the crack, and and he is actually considered a national renowned expert in insurance law. And we're very happy to have him uh, as as one of our uh, primary consultants. And uh, he makes sure that all our lobbying efforts are consistent with the IRS rules and regulations. There are some board members that uh, you were uh, you did not meet uh, at, at this juncture. And and usually at an annual meeting, when I get up, I have an opportunity to introduce each member of our board and they stand up and, and so forth. So I didn't want to leave anybody out. And there are four members that you should uh, be able to uh, know about. And, and w one of them is Pam Harrison. Pam has been on the board uh, for something like 18 years. She, she's our senior board member, okay? And she's very astute and she's the past president of the retired uh, members council in Westchester County, uh, many years as an, uh, as an association officer and secretary. So that's Pam Harrison. Uh, John Highland is another one you have not heard from today. Uh, he's a retired central office technician. He's uh, also a highly decorated uh, New York City auxiliary policeman, uh, sergeant, police sergeant, and he's the past president of the AP, he, he's a current president of the APBA and he's been so for the last for almost 40 years. Uh, he's involved in everything. I don't think he ever sleeps. He's a member of the Hibernians. He's a member of the American Legion. He's, uh, he's also, he was also the 2010 aide to the Grand Marshal representing the Bronx. So he's a guy who, who never sleeps 
and uh, he also marches twice in the uh, St. Patrick's Day parade, uh, once on the, with the auxiliary police and, the, and another one with the Hibernians. Tommy Steed uh, worked as a lineman uh, in northern Manhattan, as well as mid-state. Uh, he retired as a TTA, which is the highest craft title and was a CWA union organizer and is our subject matter expert on the sickness and death benefit. There was a recent article in the newsletter about that, which uh, uh, is something that everybody should be familiar with. Uh, then we have Lionel Brandon, who's the executive VP and my uh, second in command. Uh, he uh, it has a beautiful British accent born in London, England. Uh, he worked as a rep in the business office and also did stints in plant. And uh, uh, he was a training instructor, which is ideal with his accent. Uh, he's a past president of the Nova 5 Telephone Pioneers. So he, he brings an abundance of experience and know-how to uh, our organization. And uh, uh, he's, he was a major addition for us. Our Association strategy really covers four legs of a chair, so to speak. Uh, we invite, we get involved in negotiation, and that's with Verizon uh, and and Prudential. We also have proxy proposals, which are the bane of Verizon's existence each year, and uh, we have uh, attorneys who help us in that respect. We we get involved in lobbying within the confines of the IRS regulations. And we also, when necessary, uh, get involved in litigation. Uh, there are two, two instances where we took cases to the very steps to the Supreme Court. Okay, so that's, that has been our ongoing strategy. And this is a, we have the machinery in place and I always make an appeal to all of our cousins, our cousins who are also considered bellheads like me. And these are people from various organizations, various branches of what used to be Ma Bell, the Bell companies. And uh, whether you're from Western Electric or AT&T or Long Lines or any of the new uh, branches that have, have formed, you're welcome in the Association of Bell Tell Retirees. Okay, we call ourselves Bell Tell retirees. We don't specify that you're a Verizon retiree or a, or or anything else. Uh, we're Bell Tell retirees, and we all belong in the same family. And if you know anybody who's a retiree like that, they should be part of our family. And uh, and we have all the machinery in place to help. Um, now I just want to review a few irons in the fire that we've that we have. Uh, you know we're involved in the Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, I've written some articles about that, and uh, we're, we continue with that issue, uh, the issue with UMass Memorial Health in central Massachusetts, the issue with the villages, and the concept of exclusivity. I won't go into details now, but you can read about it in the newsletters. Okay, it's, uh, and uh, we also talked about MedPAC, Okay, this is the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. Very important. Okay, and you you should be, become familiar with that. And they have written uh, lengthy reports in 2018 and 19. All right, uh, adding what they sh say should be changes in the way payments are made by Medicare. Uh, we're talking about for Medicare Advantage plans, it's costing Medicare $274 billion, that's in 2019, to cover Medicare Advantage plans. That's $274 billion. Okay, and I, that money should be used uh, prudently. We've, I've written letters to the Honorable Chairman Richard Neal, who's the Chairman of the Ways, Committee, uh, Ways and Means Committee, and also the Honorable Lloyd Doggett, uh, who's the He's from Texas and he's the chairman of the health subcommittee. All right, these are, I wanna know what Congress has been doing after they're reading the MedPAC reports, if they're even doing that. And I think it's, it's important for you and us that we pursue that. Um, 
Now, I also wrote, by the way, to, to Daniel Webster, who's the representative from uh, uh, the villages in, uh, in Florida. Uh, Another thing that I wanted to make sure you knew about is the Express Scripts. Uh, they're coming out with a new formulary. If, if you're looking at this and it's October 14th, their new formulary is coming out tomorrow. And uh, tomorrow, uh, they're going to talk about changes in that formulary. You're going to be seeing a price increase. Okay. And they're also, what, what interests me specifically, are the changes drugs migrate from one tier to the next. And uh, if we come up with anything, we review that and we'll make sure if we see anything that jumps off the page, we'll make sure you know about it. Um, now, we're also pursuing uh, pensions and uh, annuity increases with both Prudential and Verizon. I know it's been a long time, 1991, since uh, that's been done. And uh, I know in, we, there was a one-shot deal in August of 2000 where retirees of former uh, craft and management who had retired before 1995 uh, received a one-time lump sum. Uh, the special retiree supplemental uh, pension benefit payment, that's what it was called. They even had an acronym for it. Uh, that varied from $2,500 to $20,000. Retirees received an initial notice of that in February 2000, um, so forth. Uh, I wanted to uh, do a shout out, especially to our office staff. These are the two women, uh, Steph and Kathleen, who are the recipients of calls made to our office. And they, they have been doing a magnificent job, especially under the pandemic shuttling between home and office as well. And uh, they keep, they the blood circulation of our organization. And uh, we, we, we really owe them a debt of gratitude. And I wanted to make sure that was recognized. Um, I also uh, need to mention, mention that there have been, been several instances, including the, the, uh, the Amazon smile and, and also the, the, the the way of making charitable contributions. Uh, we've made appeals during this presentation, and I just want to echo that. Uh, and this be becomes cliche, cliche -ish after a while, uh, that we're like are the armed forces of this organization. We do the battling, but we need the ammunition, and that's where you come in, and your generous contributions are very much appreciated. Uh, I want to thank you all for your continued support. And uh, I also wish you a, very, a wonderful holiday season, if it's possible under these circumstances, try to cope as best as you can. Uh, I w and, and please, please during this holiday season and for all year long, be safe. Okay, goodbye and God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>